Well, what a great day to worship the Lord. We give Him praise. We give Him praise today for His blessings in our lives. Um, as was said, next week will be our groundbreaking ceremony after the service. We'll make our way out and uh, to a place and uh, have some prayer, have uh, some scripture reading, and uh, uh, have some shoveling. How's that? All right. Um, in the last few weeks, we've been looking at, uh, in Colossians, a couple people have asked me what kind of resources have blessed you and Gwen as you, you know, raised your family. And I mean, we dealt with uh, children last week and uh, uh, one of the books that we just recently studied with uh, our small group was How to Be a Hero to Your Kids by Josh McDowell and Dick Day. That's one of the ones that has helped us a lot. And then there is a new revised version of uh, Dr. Charles Boyd's book, Different Children, Different Needs, which really addresses that you can't parent each child the same. They, uh, and, and it was a really a breakthrough for us because uh, our, especially our older four were all, the, each one had the different uh, personality type. So it, it was a complicated family to deal with. All right. And, and then uh, Dr. Tim Kimmel's series, kind of grace-based parenting, grace-based marriages, uh, has also been uh, very helpful to me personally as I've talked to families and just uh, dealt with in people in marriages and a number of things as well. Um, but let me pray, and then we'll get right into uh, the message this morning. Father, thank you that we can praise you through song. We can praise you through blessing and dedicating a, a little boy uh, today because, Lord, uh, all of our families are here by your grace and by your love and by your plan and by your purpose. And so, Father, as we look to your word today, I just ask that you would um, indeed teach us, uh, give us your words, give us your wisdom as we look at uh, this important aspect today uh, for husbands and fathers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Right from the beginning of Colossians, we see in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 2 that Paul is writing here to Christians. He says, to the holy and faithful brothers and sisters in Christ at Colossae. And then as we've journeyed through the book of Colossians, we've understood the supremacy of Jesus Christ, that Christ is not only the creator of this universe, he's the sustainer of this universe, and that he grants us salvation because Christ, God come in the flesh, has come and won the battle over sin and death through his supremacy on the cross and his resurrection. And then as a result of that, um, I'm moving by very quickly. In uh, chapter 3, uh, since we've been raised with Christ, we are to set our minds on and hearts on the things above where Christ is seated. We, we are called as a result of knowing Jesus Christ to a totally different transformed lifestyle because the Spirit of God is at work in, within us. And Christianity is the only religion on the earth that says that the person that we trust in indwells us by the Spirit of God. That's the big difference. And, and because of that, we are called to live so differently as a result. If you look at Colossians chapter 3 and verses 5 to 9, it says very clearly we are to put to death or put off whatever belongs to the earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. And Paul's emphasis is very clear that when you come to know Jesus Christ, the earthly nature goes. In fact, we're to put it off, we're to put it to death, 
and we're to realize that what, how we once lived before Christ is not how we live after Jesus, right? And so to put off those sinful vices. But he doesn't just leave us there. He says very clearly, you got to rid yourselves of anger and rage and malice, slander, filthy language. Do not lie to each other. Um, we're, and take off the old self with its practices and put on the new self. And then in verse 12, he starts talking about the new self because he says, therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, God's church is the chosen people who know Jesus Christ, holy and dearly loved by God. We are to clothe ourselves with compassion and kindness and humility, gentleness and patience. Bear with each other. And as I said before, it doesn't mean you're to be a bear with each other. Okay? That's not what it's saying. All right? But you are to forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. And overall put these virtues on love, which binds them all together. And then he says that with, with the re- new relationships that we have, we are to have in our homes and in our marriage relationships or within the church, we are to let the peace of Christ rule. We are to be a thankful people. We are to let the word of Christ dwell in us richly as we teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. We are to be worshipers as we sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Notice again, with gratitude in your hearts to God, the mark of a follower of Jesus Christ is this grateful heart, a thankful heart, right? And then whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's basically saying there, whatever you do, whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And that, that's a whole life commitment. The Christian life just is just an add on to your life that, well, we only call on Jesus, you know, when when we've got pressure in our life, we 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 pray and and then and, and kind of get God on our side. No, he says basically that Christ becomes Lord of every aspect of our life and we grow into that as well. He teaches us. So why does Christ really want us to put on these virtues that the Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives? Well, because God does not want rebellion in the family. That's why. In 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, For rebellion is like the sin of divination or sorcery and arrogance like the evil of idolatry. I know a little bit about sorcery and divination because in my extended family, I I buried an aunt and uncle who were involved in it just a couple of weeks ago. And with sorcery, it means witchcraft or sorcery. uh, When there's intimidation in a family, manipulation in a family, or secrecy in a family, that's what that is. And it's so dangerous. But that's why we are to put on the virtues of Christ. We are to put on Christ first. We are to know Jesus Christ. So with that introduction, look at verse 18. It says, wives, submit to your husbands as fitting in the Lord. So this is the one thing for Christian wives to to submit or respect their husbands. We saw that a couple weeks ago. And then I kind of went down to verse 20 last week with children. The one thing children are to do, Christian children are to do, followers of Christ are to do, is to what? Obey their parents, right? Because these simple things really take us back to what Paul talks about earlier in chapter 3 by putting on those virtues. And one of the things that we can do as parents particularly is teach these godly virtues and model them in our homes so that our families are strong and not rebellious in any way. So put on the virtues of Christ. One thing for wives, one thing for children. And of course, there's some wives here and maybe some children here 
that are just waiting for this one thing for fathers and husbands today. They've been waiting two weeks for this message on Father's Day. So look at verse 19. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Verse 21, fathers, in fact, uh, some translations have this. This is kind of an overarching um, uh, saying here. Fathers, parents, do not embitter your children or they will become discouraged. So the one thing for husbands is just very clear, right? Love your wives, love your wives. And notice here that the husband is given a role here of authority, but it's not to treat his wife as a subject or a doormat. The husband's call is to sacrificial love. Love is meeting the needs of others regardless of the cost to self. Again, the model for this is Christ himself. And the parallel passage, if you want to read it, is found in Ephesians 5, 22 to 23, makes it even clearer that the husband is to love his wife just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, the church, Ephesians 5, uh, 25. When husbands lead with love, the submission of wives is more natu naturally follows. In contrast to the love to which he, he calls husbands, Paul commands that the Christian husband not be harsh with his wife. He is not to use his authority to be overbearing, critical, or bitter. But notice something here. Husbands, it says, husbands. A husband is one man married to one woman. In Christ, God shows no favors. God is both for the husband and the wife with equal measure. And what God is saying here, that this is a biological male who is married to a biological woman. I just want to be clear culturally today. All right. Why? Because God purposed this, that this would be the relationship to start a new family with the capacity to bear children to carry on to the next generation. Yesterday, as most of you know, it was uh, Gwen's mother's uh, funeral service. And we were in Cambridge at her church, Forward Baptist, and uh, we had quite the service. And uh, there was singing, there was crying, there was laughter. Uh, there was clear messages from grandchildren, from Gwen and her sisters. And I was able to share the gospel very clearly as well because of just the amazing um, mother-in-law I had. Through that whole service, I, it, it was emotional. It was clear, though about where Evangeline's faith was, and it was in Jesus Christ. So I got up to preach, and I had asked Gwen beforehand, can I tell a couple of funny stories about mom? Because I can hardly get up to do this today. She said, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got up. I was a little bit of the weeping pastor yesterday. But maybe we need to be... More weeping, I think, at times in our families. Because yesterday afternoon, after we had the service and we had food for everyone who came, we went to the graveside. My nephew, Sean, who had, has actually played drums here a number of times for us, and he lives down near Elmer now, but, I mean, he, he had built a really nice uh, box to bury mum. And the clan of Evangeline and Wes Laird surrounded the gravesite yesterday. Um, there were four generations there. And, and, and it was an amazing time. Three daughters who married three men who had 10 children. And now those children have produced 16 grandchildren. And they were all sitting on the grass. As we read scripture, we sang together and just shared with one another the love of God that first began in Gwen's mom and dad that has been passed on 
into the generations. It was a very powerful thing, the legacy of family when we follow God's ways. Paul here offers a careful balance. Neither party, the wife or the husband, is to be arrogant or domineering. Wives are to respect their husbands as fitting in the Lord. Husbands love their wives and are not to be harsh with them. The submission here is not that of a slave or a doormat. It actually begins as a mutual submission to Jesus Christ. And when, when a wife and a husband are submitted to Jesus Christ, they have the right order right away. <laughs> because both need to be submitted to Christ. And as a result, this takes away any temptation from either the wife or the husband to try to be controlling or, or use domestic blackmail or to, to be harsh at all because we love Jesus Christ so much because he's transformed our lives so much that our relationship is transformed by him because we want to be obedient to him because of his grace. Naturally, Paul wants the relationship between Christian wives and Christian husbands to embody the lordship of Jesus Christ for all to see. And this is impossible when marriages are abusive or when one spouse is prevented from the other from realizing the good intentions in the Lord that God has for them. And, and, and so should a Christian wife continue to submit uncritically to her husband, if, if he's abusive in any way or uh, unspiritual and walking away from the things of God, I think not. And, and, and it's very important to see here that, that the kind of love that Paul is talking about as husbands truly love their wives, this is not the Greek word phileo here of a friendship love. This is not the word for eros, which is the other Greek word for romantic love, nor is it here the, the word storge for a parent-child love here. Husbands are to love their wives with agape love, the love of God. And in the scriptures, this agape love is only a love that comes from God. And, and when husbands love their wives this way, Husbands set the tone for the family. Did you know that? They set the tone. The Edmonton Oilers last night set the tone for the game. Finally. Finally. Right? They set the tone. But men who initiate this sacrificial love of Christ, as they are seeking Christ and, and living their life for Christ, they, they build up their, their godly wives and they respond with respect and submission to their wise leadership. And maybe the greatest prayer that I've ever prayed is this, Lord, teach me to love. Teach me to love like you. It says here, husbands, love your wives. Then it says, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. So you can't be harsh and love at the same time. You can speak the truth in love. Uh, a gentle answer turns away wrath. We need to realize as men that self-control is being Christ-controlled and controlled by the Spirit of God. Paul's exhortation to Christian husbands here is not to be harsh with their wives. It recalls their conversion from the vices of sin before they knew Christ to the virtues of Christ so that, th that people within the household don't become embittered. And this is a very powerful thing because this binding love of God through Christ happens as we uh, yield day by day, moment by moment to the Spirit of God. That doesn't mean families won't have problems. How many of you have had problems in your family? Okay, Some of you are going to have them this week then if you don't have one right now. Because there's problems, right? But it's how we respond to the problems. He's saying here that harshness is reaction, right? It's not response. It's not a godly response. And, and, and so he, he, he brings us back to the understanding here that this harshness 
produces bitterness and poison within the family. And that as men, we set the tone to not be harsh, but be gentle and be disciples of Jesus Christ. In other words, as Paul writes in Ephesians 5, he basically says, Husbands, treat your bride as Christ treats his bride, the church, with sacrificial love. Did you hear me? Husbands, treat your bride as Christ treats his bride, the church, with sacrificial love. Now, I I know life is difficult right now for so many people. Men do hard things in this world. I look at some of the guys I drive by, and yeah, there's five maybe standing around a hole, but there's at least two down in the hole, right? They're most likely the most experienced people in the hole. And it's dirty and it's awful. And there's other jobs throughout that men do. But men, you can be a beast at work or a beast on the sports field, but you cannot be a beast at home. You need to be a loving, caring shepherd leader at home who protects, provides for his wife and children so that the family thrives. When you provide men in a godly way, your wife is a multiplier, right? A multiplier. You've got to understand that. When you put the Lord first, and men, do you know the Lord Jesus? I got the the three new deacons at the front there, three young guys at the front, (laughs) right? But I want them to grow up to be men of God, and if they get married and have children, I want them to be godly men who follow hard after Jesus, who listen to the Spirit's work in their life, reading the Bible, understanding what it means to truly be a man of God who protects and provides for his family. Jesus is God He is our creator. He's our sustainer. And there have been many times where I have conversations with men, whether it's at the restaurant or somewhere else, and they find out I'm a pastor or whatever. And and these these are conversations that are happening right near me. And and, and they go, well, I believe in God. And and I often ask, well, so which God do you believe in? Huh? Because it could be the God of money. Could be the God of sports. We got a lot of gods that take men away from being the men of God they need to be. It might be the God of gold, right? I mean, in our city, we have a cow (laughs) as you come in. You, You can worship cows. Did you know that? There's some Old Testament stuff about that. You're not supposed to worship cows. You're supposed to worship the living God. And Jesus Christ is the living God. And if you've allowed yourself to fall into the trap of these other gods, and maybe it is erotica or pornography or something else, the devil wants you to be as far away from the things of God as he can get you. Because he will destroy you. He'll destroy you if you don't know the living God, Jesus Christ, who is our creator, sustainer, and our savior. He's the only God you need to know because he will make you the man that God wants you to be. Jesus Christ transforms us so that we see the transformation of God for generations. That means forgiving one another. And in some marriages, it's all about finding fault with each other. And, 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 and always correcting each other. Why don't you start thanking each other for the things that, start, that are going well? Start building up thankfulness because Paul talks about this here in Colossians 3. He names gratitude three times. He's not talking about fault finding or correcting all the time. Catch some people doing right in your family, would you? All right? And, and God hates divorce. He knows how divorce destroys marriage and parenting and, and, and child and relationships. Addictions do the same thing. We start believing that this pill or this, this bottle or this other thing will satisfy and give peace in our life. No, Christ is the Prince of Peace. 
He's the one who understands the trauma we might have been through as a young man or as a child in the family we grew up in. But God wants to restore you because that's what he does. And, and that's the powerful thing that Jesus does for us. Maybe you need to get some help, get some mentoring or some coaching. And he says here then, fathers, do not embitter your children or they'll become discouraged. This is a strong word to us, not only as fathers, but, but parents. Children need loving discipline, but so do parents. And, and, and so as, as, as we understand what Paul is saying here, that we have the power to set the tone in the family with our children as well as fathers and husbands. And just as the authority of the husband is not to lead to the harshness with the wife, the authority of the fathers is not to lead to the kind of behavior that will embitter their children. The Christian father is not to overcorrect or, or harass his children or they'll become discouraged, which refers to a, a, what Paul describes here is this word is a listless, sullen resignation, a broken spirit. To be discouraged as a child means to think like, I'll never get it right. Or all, he, all they do is criticize me. They, they, they don't really love me. I never measure up. These are statements of brokenness. So what's a father to do? Here's the quick top ten list. You ready? They're not even in your notes online. How's that? Because I wrote them late last night with all that's been going on. What's a husband or father to do? We'll make sure they, these go up. He loves God and follows Jesus in the power of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 22, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Number two, he loves and sacrifices for his wife. See that in Ephesians chapter 5. Jesus is his example. If you want to be a better husband, a better father, start following G hard after Jesus. He is the coach for your life. He's been my coach, and I'm so glad. What does a father or husband do? He provides for his children. 1 Timothy 5, 8. Fourthly, he provides for his relatives. Did you know that? 1 Timothy 5, 8 says, Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, and especially for their own household, has de divide, denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. That's strong stuff. He prays for his children. 1 Chronicles 29, 19, King David prays for his son Solomon. He wants the next generation to follow God. Are you, as a father, husband, grandfather, great-grandfather, praying for your children, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren? One of the aspects we, we knew about Gwen's mom and dad is they prayed for us constantly. I think they prayed for me more because they knew I needed it, maybe. But we pray for, their ch pray for our children. They also... These fathers and godly husbands encourage their children. 1 Thessalonians 2, 11 to 12 says, For you know that we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Seventhly, he teaches his children Proverbs 22, 6, uh, along with his wife, train children up on the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not turn from it. There's this teaching aspect that has to be a part of everyday life and family life. Are you praying at the table together when you eat? Are you reading the scripture there? Are you having some discussion about that? Right? We teach. But we also disciple and it goes along with this, and, and discipline children as well. 
Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. Because discipleship and discipline is necessary for teaching our children and our grandchildren the ways of the Lord, not the ways of the world. And some of us fathers are teaching our children the ways of the world rather than the ways of the Lord. And this is a this is a hard maybe a hard thing for us because we hear certain things or we believe certain things or you know our kid is going to be you know the next Connor McDavid. Well there's only one Connor McDavid. And your kid is not it. Okay? Or not he or whatever I want to I got to use the right pronoun I guess there. Right? Right? And, and, and so that takes discipline to help, the, help those children understand God's plan for their life, not your plan for their life. There's a big difference between the two. All right? He disciplines and disciples. And number nine, he sets a good example for his children. I love what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Jesus Christ. Right. Do you remember that phrase? Maybe your parents used it. You know. Do as I say. How many of you? Can you finish it for me? Do as I say, not what I do. Sorry. It's not a good example. Right. It's not a good example. Follow my example. Paul says, as I follow the example of Jesus Christ, does your children, grandchildren, see Jesus in you? Moms and dads, do your children see Jesus in you? And then the number 10, he loves his children. Loves his children. And the word love here goes beyond the storge love that the Greeks had, parent to child. This love is the love that God has granted to me through faith in Jesus Christ. As a result, I can love. And we look back, you know, Gwen and I look back. You know, there have been so many times where we went through a crisis or some difficulty, even with one of our children. And, and I'm so thankful that we went to God first rather than reacting because the times where we reacted didn't go well because we left God out of it. And, and, and so Paul is just pushing this here. See, men, we live heroically and courageously when we live as men of the kingdom of God. When we love our wives sacrificially and serve and build up our children so that they thrive and carry out the purpose of God in their life. Because of this, God is glorified. God is glorified. God is glorified. This morning, I'm just going to have all the young men and the old men like me stand. I'm just going to pray for all of you. Next week, we have uh, the... Uh, yeah, there's a few of you old men can still stand, I think, with me. All right? I just want to you today and next week you know we have a groundbreaking and and then the the week after that jay's going to bring a message for uh singles as well because there's lots to say about that half the population in our country or in north america right now people are living as single adults right we have have to say a lot about that as well but as families we need to be in prayer and as a church family that has children and youth and adults, men and women at different stages in our life, more than ever, we need to pray for one another and encourage each other in the times that we're living in. Christ is returning. Christ is setting up a lot of things over these next few years, days, months, decades, we don't know when he returns, but he calls us no matter what to live for him.
to live for him. Let me pray for you men today. Father, I thank you for your word to us today. I thank you for these young men, these older men, men who are new fathers today, men who have children and been married a while, men who've seen their children leave home, but they are still men who are influencing others around them. Father, I pray that you would bless us all. And for these young men, teenage young men, I pray, Lord God, that they would take to heart the messages they've been hearing over these last few weeks, that Christ would be the leader of their life, the savior of their life, the coach in their life, and the one that will shepherd them so that they can shepherd those around them with the love and grace of God in the power of the Spirit of God, I pray. And so, Father, thank you that we've been able to spend this time in your word today. Bless us as we sing this last song, and then as Janice comes and just shares a few details about the barbecue and prays for it, Father, May we enjoy incredible fellowship together. In Jesus' name, amen.